Okay, I believe we are recording. Welcome everyone. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jeffrey Klein, our SNA board liaison for publications and editor emeritus of Radiographics. Dr. Klein, thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Terrific. So um, let's just uh, do this. And again, thanks for the uh, for the invitation. Um, and as far as disclosures are concerned, I don't think any of these are pertinent to today's topic. Um, but I do receive royalties from Walters Kluwer as the editor of the Brant and Helms Fundamentals of Diagnostic Radiology textbook. And as um, Chuck has mentioned, I do serve as the board liaison for publications and communications. And so I'm most familiar, uh, obviously, with the RSNA suite of journals. And so you'll you'll note that a number of my comments will speak directly towards some of our policies and procedures. So my objectives for the next uh, 20 minutes or so would be first to review some of the recommended uh, and published um, uh, qualifications or recommendations for how authorship and contributorship is determined for imaging journals. And I'm sure you're probably mostly familiar with those that uh, the Radiology AI and the RSA journals uses and many uh, imaging journals use, which is the um, the ICMJE recommendations for authorship. We'll go through those. Uh, I'll just touch on an, another um, taxonomy, which is increasingly used probably more in some of the basic science journals. And that's something called CREDIT, which is an acronym, which I'll illustrate, which sort of is a little more granular than what we use with our journals and what most imaging journals use to determine who has contributed what to a particular article. I'll talk a little bit about authorship order, particularly dual first authorship. And uh, we'll share with you a little survey that I did of imaging journals and how they um, determine authorship. Um, and uh, then last, what I'll do is just maybe at the end, make a, a recommendations for some of you who are trainees on how to handle and deal with authorship issues, which I know can be very prickly, particularly when you're dealing with senior colleagues and uh, authorship issues uh, can be a little bit contentious. So hopefully I can provide some recommendations to avoid some of the more difficult issues that might arise. So why is authorship important? Um, obviously, uh, authorship provides a, a tangible record of the contribution that an article makes to, and that you make as the author of an article to scholarly activity. Um, it's one of the main forms of academic currency that we have and that we value. Uh, it also confirms a responsibility that an author has for participating in a particular published work. It is a method that you, we use to communicate research output, and it allows you to collaborate with others beyond your own particular research group and institution. So it's really a form of communication. Obviously, authorship provides certain opportunities uh, that uh, will become available to you if you've been a successful author in a particular area. So the opportunity to get grants and to obtain funding for your research, obviously, will be predicated on being the author or involved in scholarly activity that's been published. In some institutions and in certain parts of the world, it's a very important component of one's salary and promotions, particularly in the European and Asian um, um, parts of the world. Uh, and obviously, it provides opportunities for leadership. Uh, for administrative opportunities, uh, either within societies or within your particular institution. And uh, finally, obviously, uh, those of you who have aspirations to become more uh, intricately involved with editorial boards, perhaps would like to be editors uh, on your own accord at some point with a scholarly journal, obviously, being a successful author is going to be an important component of making you qualified for and be considered seriously for any of those particular leadership roles with, with any of the journals. Now, as you would probably surmise, and you may have had some experiences with this, authorship issues can be particularly uh, prickly, and they're pretty common. And like many things in this world, they're probably underreported because they're kind of contentious issues at times. 
it's, it's important to recognize that different fields in science will have different rules as to how authorship is defined. For example, if you are a researcher, for example, in particle physics, there can be research papers with hundreds of authors, and, and each of those authors have contributed perhaps to the technical development of a particular um, technique. And you'll see a long, long list of authors that are given in alphabetical order. So different fields will have different rules as to who qualifies for authorship. It's also important to realize that authorship, as I mentioned, gives credit for work, but also is, uh, brings accountability for that particular uh, piece of research, uh, which is great if it becomes highly cited and um, not so great if it becomes infamous. And uh, perhaps uh, you need to take a share of responsibility for something that has been published that perhaps um, had some ethical or other uh, um, issue associated with it. Um, interestingly, there are certain scoring systems that are used with cer within certain institutions and research groups to determine authorship. For example, uh, there are some groups that actually have a point system where depending upon what you've done, as far as the research is concerned, you'll get a certain number of points uh, and then based on the cumulative number of points, that will determine whether you qualify as an author and in particular, what order in the list of authors you qualify for. So the individual, for example, in some of these systems with the most points will be the first author and so on and so forth. And one of the things I think it's really important to emphasize, and I'll touch on this uh, later on, is that it's really best to deal with authorship issues uh, up front before you begin engaging in a research a project that you're going to be submitting for publications. Like a lot of things, um, it's best to deal with it in your own research group or institution because most journals and publishers don't really have the resources or the, uh, or the uh, um, um, opportunity to address some of these issues. So it's really important to try to deal with these issues uh, up front before they become contentious. Um, so what constitutes authorship? So there are actually a number of different uh, organizations and groups that have published recommendations for what defines authorship. And the one that uh, our journals use and that most imaging journals use, and I'll detail in a minute, is the one that has been published by the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, or ICMJE. But there are other organizations and groups that publish their own series of recommendations. There is the World Association of Medical Editors, or WAMI, one of my favorite acronyms, uh, that has its own series of uh, published recommendations. Uh, the Council of Science Editors, which publishes a number of different documents and guidelines for uh, editors and editorial boards and publishers as far as ethical issues in scholarly publishing are concerned. And certain institutions like the NIH and, and Cambridge University and other organizations will actually have their own sets of criteria as to what defines authorship. What they all have in common pretty much is that authorship is related to, or you, in order to qualify for authorship, one has to have one provided a substantial contribution to the work that's being published, and second, you have to be accountable for your work. And this accountability issue is really important and actually something that actually came to definitions or, or criteria for authorship sort of, sort of after the other more obvious criteria. So let me just share with you what the ICME, ICMJE recommendations are for authorship. And there's four criteria basically. So the first is that one, has to have made substantial contributions to the conception or design of the work or it's the acquisition and analysis or interpretation of data. So this is an important component. You have to be, have been involved in drafting the work or revising it for critical content. You have to have given final approval for whatever is going to be published. And the fourth criteria, which was the last one that was added, is that again, you have to be accountable for aspects of the work to ensure that any questions that arise relating to any of the accuracy of the content or the integrity of any part of the work or its development 
uh, is going to be appropriately investigated and resolved. So these are the four criteria. And basically, um, it's important to note that, the, again, the last criterion was the one that was added the most recently, because there were individuals who were involved in the conception and design of the work and writing the work and in improving it. But then it's important that people be accountable for the integrity of that work that's published. So this begs the question, what does not constitute authorship? And so it's important to recognize that simply acquiring funding for the research work that's being published does not qualify one for authorship. Uh, being an administrative support individual or supervising a research project does not qualify as a uh, component of authorship. Assisting in the writing, the technical or language editing or proofreading, again, are all important components of a research project that's published, but does not necessarily qualify one for authorship. Most of our journals allow those who've made one of these other contributions to be acknowledged in the work that's published, but it does not qualify one for authorship. And this is actually a, a screen capture of a table published by the NIH. As I mentioned, the NIH has their own sets of uh, recommendations or guidelines for authorship. And what I like about this is that it's color coded. So for those of us who struggle to read lists or tables, you can see here that in the various components, the green is good and the fuchsia or pink here is, is <laughs> I wouldn't say bad, but does not necessarily qualify one for authorship. And so just focusing on those things that do not qualify or constitute authorship, simply being a supervisor of an individual for their training or education or mentoring of the first author does not qualify one for authorship unless you've made substantive contributions to the study as well. Similarly, such just providing resources or importantly, being someone who is involved in reading the manuscript or commenting on it, uh, again, does not necessarily qualify for uh, authorship. So I mentioned uh, in the beginning that there are other um, sort of lists or taxonomies that uh, can be employed in determining what role an author has played in the public in a particular work that gets published. And there is this acronym called CREDIT, which is short for the Contributor Roles Taxonomy. And this is, as you can see, a very granular list of various aspects of research projects and uh, writing manuscripts that can be used to describe an individual's particular role in, in the formation of a particular um, uh, article. And I won't go into great detail here because you can see it gets very granular, but many in imaging journals are now using various components of this. And, and as I'll illustrate in a few minutes, uh, the RSNA journals use sort of a, a abbreviated list of this taxonomy to give an indication of who was responsible for what. Because if you're going to hold people accountable for various components of a research work, you have to know what role they played in the various aspects of the research project and the publication. So this is just a, a, a list. And as I mentioned, uh, this has been adopted to more or less of a degree for various imaging journals. So, oops, next item I want to talk about is authorship order. And I want to touch on first author issues. And obviously, first author should be, at least in our field, in, in any of the biological sciences, first author tends to be the individual who did the work and is the guarantor of the particular study that's being published. As you probably know, the last author, sort of the place of pride, is typically given to the senior individual, either the PI running the particular lab or research group, or perhaps it might be your division chief or chair who is involved in the project, uh, is typically listed as the last or senior author. And then, as you probably know, there's an increasing tendency now, given the multidisciplinary and multi-institutional nature of a lot of research, to designate individuals as dual first authors or even dual senior or corresponding authors. So this is increasingly common and is a, uh, these are uh, designations that are increasingly recognized and supported by journals, including the imaging journals. 
So just to give you a little uh, background as to how imaging journals handle authorship issues, I did a little informal survey in preparation for this, uh, this presentation of 20 different uh, radiology journals, or as you can see, families of journals, because obviously you can see in this table here, I've listed both the uh, research journals that we publish for RSNA, radiology, and the suite journals, but also radiographics. And then you can see a variety of other primarily subspecialty imaging journals. And I wanted to determine how these journals determine authorship and what they provide for uh, authors or those who of us who are submitting to their journals, what the guidelines are that they publish as far as designating authorship issues. So the questions that I looked into in particular were first, how, how do these journals define authorship? Do they endorse the ICMJE set of four criteria or some equivalent set of criteria? Do they have a limit on the number of authors that you can include in a particular publication? Uh, do they utilize any specific contributor roles as has been recommended by ICMGE or perhaps some version of the credit or other taxonomy? And finally, do any of the imaging journals recognize and support the concept of dual first or senior authorship? Or sometimes, journals can actually have multiple corresponding authors. So I wanted to determine exactly what imaging journals do as regards these four various aspects of authorship. So as far as qualifying for authorship, it turns out that uh, when it comes to what defines authorship, 15 of the 20 journals adhere to the ICMGE criteria. Uh, either the initial three criteria or all four criteria. Again, the fourth of which is being accountable for the uh, integrity of the work that's being published. One of the journals doesn't list any criteria for authorship and four, I'm sorry, one rather lists some other criteria, not uh, those of the ICMGE. And then four of the 20 uh, give no criteria for authorship, which I thought was interesting. As far as limits on the number of authors were concerned, you can see that, see that the majority of imaging journals do not have a limit on the number of authors that can be listed on a paper published in their journal. Four of the 20 do have limits. Uh, two of them had, had a limit of no more than seven authors for original investigations and less than or equal to five authors for an opinion or commentary piece. One of them allowed more than 10 authors, but you had to submit a letter of explanation as to why it warranted having that many authors. And one actually allows more than 20 authors. Uh, and again, requiring a letter of explanation. When it comes to contributor roles, a little more granular accounting of what roles each of the authors played in the development of the particular manuscript, you can see that eight of the 20 journals actually have uh, or recommend contributor statements. And, and these are, again, mostly versions of the credit taxonomy. And I'll, for illustration purposes, just show you what this looks like for a couple of journals. This is actually from the publication information for authors page from Clinical Radiology, which is an Elsevier publication. And you can see here that they require that if you are an author, that you designate which of the following components of the particular article you are responsible for. Um, when it comes to our journals, you can see that this is an example from uh, radiology. Uh, we have a set of acknowledgments that appears at the end of each of our papers. And then we designate the various author contributions, but they're broken down into four or five different categories, whether you're a guarantor, of the integrity of the study, whether you're involved in the data design acquisition or analysis, um, drafting of the content, et cetera. And then obviously the disclosure statements, if there are any conflicts of interest, particularly for articles that involve industry. And just to show you what this looks like, and I know Radiology AI and all of our journals adhere to this, you can see that again, this is sort of a, specifically coming from one of our articles, this lists the various uh, components of the uh, article that each of the authors designated by their initials uh, it was responsible for. 
So this is something that all of our journals do, and I think you'll see this increasingly in most of the imaging journals. And the final issue I looked into was whether there was uh, an opportunity for either dual first or dual senior authorship with the journals. And you can see that most of the journals that I surveyed allow dual first authorship as long as you provide a letter of explanation to the editor as to why your particular article qualifies for dual first authorship, assuming that there is more than one individual that contributed equally and substantially to the development of a particular article. Several of the journals allow for dual senior authorship, again, with a letter of explanation to the editor. And one of the journals actually allows for dual corresponding authors to be designated. And you can see here in uh, the publication information for authors page from uh, the journal Radiology, and you'll see an identical statement in Radiology AI and in all of our journals. This is the uh, statement in which we, we ask that if the authors feel that it's essential to indicate that there are two authors that have made an equal contribution, they'll be so identified in the caption uh, and in the author's footnotes on the title page, and similarly for senior authors. And uh, you have to make this request uh, in the cover letter when you submit the article. Um, so this is an opportunity and uh, this is an increasing uh, pol uh, increasing the uh, popular thing, and again, in many of the research articles that are being published in which there's multidisciplinary or multi-institutional um, involvement. So I just want to sort of finish up with a series of recommendations for those of you who are in training uh, as far as best practices as regards authorship is concerned. And I think I can't emphasize enough how important it is to try to deal with these issues in advance when you're first developing the research project or, or the, the uh, concepts for the paper that you're going to submit. It's really better to deal with these things um, up front rather than having to deal with them post hoc, uh, I think for obvious reasons. Um, this could be really difficult um, because there are difficult conversations to have, but I think it's important as best you can to try to designate these issues or try to sort these issues out in advance of the development of your particular manuscript. It's also important to look at the guidelines for authors. If you're, if you're targeting your particular manuscript for a particular journal, it's important to know who qualifies for authorship. Or in particular, if you feel like you're undertaking a project where you feel that it's likely there's going to be a need for requesting dual first authorship, you want to know that that journal supports that policy. Uh, and also it's important to understand who and how contributorship is, is, is designated for that particular journal. So become knowledgeable about these issues beforehand if possible. It's also important to realize that journal edit editors and the editorial staff that work with journals can be utilized as a resource when it's necessary to deal with these issues. But again, these are, we really have a limited ability as editorial board members and as publishers to deal with these issues post hoc it's really best to adjudicate these issues within your own group or department or institution. And as you probably know, many larger institutions actually have individuals or ombudsmen that can be utilized as a resource to deal with some of these disputes or issues that arise when it comes to authorship uh, issues with a particular project. So in summary, I've tried to review some of the authorship and contributorship considerations for imaging journals. As I showed you, almost all the journals and all of the RSNA journals adhere to the ICM, ICMJE recommendations for authorship. Increasingly, uh, there's more granular designations of various components of a manuscript through a abbreviated or more robust taxonomy, such as the credit taxonomy, to determine who has done what and who's accountable for what component of the article. Authorship orders are important. And it's increasingly common to request dual first or senior authorship, and it's certainly reasonable um, to do that if you feel that it's warranted in a particular project. Uh, imaging journal guidelines should be evaluated for authorship issues as best you can before you submit and su uh, provide supporting uh, letters if you feel that this is a designation, uh, dual first or senior authorship is appropriate for your particular project. And I've tried to share with you what I would consider to be some best practices for those of you in training to try to address 
uh, when you're contributing uh, to a project, particularly with uh, more senior faculty members. And I just want to end by acknowledging um, those of you, I think Dr. Kachoya, actually, I think I saw uh, online, I want to just acknowledge the, the role of, uh, of Dr. Kachoya and the advisory panel members for your AI trainee editorial board. Um, this is a really wonderful concept that, that obviously Chuck developed with Dr. Kachoya when the journal first launched uh, you know, almost four years ago now. And it's really important uh, uh, to acknowledge the, the selflessness of individuals who are leading this effort and really training and, and mentoring the future leaders for scholarly publishing and, and leaders in our academic specialty. So I just want to acknowledge their efforts uh, on behalf of the RSNA and uh, behalf of the journal. So I think I'll uh, stop right there. And if there's questions or comments that you have about anything that I've touched on, uh, you know, please, please feel free to unmute yourself or uh, send me a message or chuck a message and I'd be happy to try to answer your question. Jeff, thank you so much for the, for the presentation. In fact, uh, one of our advisory panel members and TEB alums, Jeff Rudy, is uh, is on with us this evening. Jeff, glad you could could join us. Um, and uh, it's it's you know we're 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 looking always looking for ways that we can try to improve this uh, experience for our for our trainees. So so thanks. Well, let me I'll open it up. Let's see if there are there any. Uh, any questions for Dr. Klein? Well, I, while we're while people are giving some thought, I will I will say that one of the challenges that we have have wrestled with, and I uh, I don't know if I've figured out a, an, an entire answer for it, is what to do with data resource manuscripts. Um, these are kind of akin to the the big physics type type papers in that. Uh, quite often, there's a large uh, cadre of people who have contributed images, who have annotated images, who have helped create these incredibly important data sets. And, and part of the rationale that we had for creating this data resource manuscript type was to be able to give credit to the people who are participating in that. The challenge, of course, is that we have sort of an unofficial cap of 20 authors. Um, we we have uh, upon request we'll we'll extend that, but do we want to have sixty or a hundred or two hundred authors on, the, on on an article? And that's where things get a little ticklish. And one of the opportunities there, and and the way this is handled, for example, in many of the cooperative oncology groups, uh, you know, is to um, to have a group author listed um and then members of the who are listed then under as uh, under that group author title so it'll be uh by uh you know the article by dr klein dr Gach you know Cl the authorship is klein gachoya khan and the ecog akron investigators and then under that will be listed the 50 people who have are the site pis of participating in in that uh, group and the way it's supposed to work as i understand it, is that uh nlm indexes them in pubmed as collaborators but not not as not under the author rubric but they are then indexed and searchable and it will show up in your bibliography right uh in pubmed we've we've had a little glitch and apparently uh some of that people didn't get indexed in that way on a couple of the data resources papers that we have published so we're working to figure out how we can do that and um actually people are sort of are waiting with bated breath to to find out the answer because otherwise they want to divert potentially to a journal where they could get everyone listed as an author i don't know any I, i'm just curious as to the your your thoughts jeff and and that from any other members of the team here yeah, I think PubMed is a little bit, uh, as you as you would know, a little bit behind the behind the curve on many of these things. In fact, I'm not sure when I try to look up, uh, for example, dual first authorship. I don't know that PubMed actually provides that sort of a designation. They list the art, the authors in the order in which they appear in the parent journal, but there's no way in PubMed, I don't believe, to designate 
that, for example, there are dual first authors here. Yeah. Which, which gets to be important because, and the same for the dual senior authors, because now they allowed co-PIs for grants and because NLM is part of NIH uh, and NIH is allowing that type of funding, it, it you know, that can be a, a really uh, important issue for, for investigators to make sure they get the allotment of credit that they feel they, they deserve for the, the contribution to the work. Sure. Can I make a comment, Ms. Pedro? Yeah, please. Hi, hey, Pedro. Um, on PubMed, a few uh, journals they list the the you know the two co-first authors with a little asterisk, and they with the asterisk they say co-first authors, but um, very few journals I think do that. Um, but I think I've I've seen this in maybe one of the journals before. I will tell you, and just as a technical matter, funny things happen when you do that. Um, in some places, they will put a numeral or an asterisk or a letter um, after the, you know, as a superscript uh, following the person's name. Uh, although I've seen that where it accidentally gets picked up as part of the person's name when it's indexed. Um, so I remember an article that the scene, the first author's name was Hassanpur and it was listed as Hassanpura because they had the letter A, uh, you know, saying that they were the corresponding author, you know. So um, one has to be careful and that's an error at, at the production level. Um, journals generally are, are careful about that, but you're right. I mean, sometimes it's indicated so that as you read the names, you can tell, but as, as Dr. Klein mentioned for our, the RSNA journals, we put it as a footnote uh, saying that authors AA and BB are, are share, uh, you know, contributed equally to the, uh, to that work. And the same, and then you do the same for senior authors and, and, and for any contributing authors. Has anybody had a situation? I, I will tell you, you know, as, as uncomfortable as it might feel when you're starting a project to say, um, where will I be in as author of this paper? Um, it's even worse and less comfortable when you've gotten to the end of it and you've done all the work and you thought you were going to be first author of the paper, especially if you're aspiring to an academic career and you're looking to make sure you have, you know, as, as you start going up for tenure, um, to have these in place, um, to find out after you've done the work that no, you aren't being listed as, has any, I, I'm just curious, does, uh, has anybody had those and, and any thoughts about how to have that conversation? So that was unfortunate I had, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Klein, I saw you unmuted, did you wanna? No, please go ahead. So I, unfortunately I have had that experience when I was uh, in medical school as a second year medical student. And at that time, I think there's a couple of factors that come into play, power dynamics being one of them. Uh, and one, you know, and you do the work, you work hard, and unfortunately that, that did happen. And, but what Dr. Klein mentioned in terms of having a point system, that was, that's really interesting for me because I actually hadn't heard of that. But I could see how that may try to make this process a little more objective in terms of, well, here's, a quantifiable representation of how much work was put into the project. And almost like a meritocracy, right? If you, if you have the most points here, you, you achieve that rank, that, that level in the authorship. Is that, is that common or is that uh, one of the reported benefits of using that system? Just you out know, of curiosity, I, I because I see seen, it as a solution. Yeah, I have not seen that in an imaging journal. I think it's probably, as you would imagine, more common in some of the uh, computational and mathematical sciences. <laughs> As you would you would guess, and um, you know you could always argue well how to one determine the relative merit or score of a particular effort, I, but it does provide a little bit of objectivity. I, I think in response to the question, I think this is really where having a mentor, perhaps who is not involved in the particular project, but who can advocate on your behalf, is really important. Um, because they're probably not nearly as concerned a, a, as you would be in alienating faculty member or a senior individual. Um, so that's what I would recommend is if you've got somebody that 
you could who can advocate for you, who might be seen as a mentor who isn't particularly involved in that project to, to advocate on your behalf if you're uncomfortable in doing that yourself. Hey there, sorry. Hi, Chuck. Hi, Jeff. Hey, I just, um, I had a, a kind of a, like a comment kind of question thinking about authorship. I mean, you know, going through my PhD, um, working, you know, a lot of different projects. One of the things is, I mean, you mentioned, you know, how just being on a grant or just co making comments on the uh, paper shouldn't technically make you an author, but I kind of find that in reality, that's not the case. Um, there, are, I feel like, you know, middle authors are pretty easy to be added and, you know, they're part of the research group. They're, um, you know, they, usually it's the senior author that says, well, this person's going to be added on the paper. You, most papers and projects, in my opinion, are, are you know, 80% done by the first author, 20% done by the senior. There are some projects where there may be a second, third author that contributes significantly, but in practice, I feel like there's a bunch of middle authors that don't really do anything. And maybe they, you know, you, but the thing is you, you know, you do the project, you, you put it all together, you have a paper and then your, your PI says, well, let's, this is the draft of the paper, send it out to the authors. And, and this person's going to be an author too. And, you know, lot, oftentimes they will actually have significant important contributions. They might recommend you do some more analyses. Um, but some, uh, oftentimes they won't have, they'll have zero comments, but they've already been listed as an author on the manuscript. Um, I don't know. I, I, I just, I just kind of wanted to state that as an, as yeah, like, uh, and whether that, again, that's kind of the power dynamics, you know, is, you know, sort of, uh, doing something political, uh, right. You know, well, that person has a lab that we want, you know, we want to give them some recognition and we hope that, you know, the next thing project they'll include us. I don't know, Jeff, do you have, do you have, uh, Jeff Klein, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I recognize what, what Jeff has shared. I think we all recognize that that's, how it happens in, in, in the real world. Um, I think again, that these are issues that are, are have to be left with the particular group or institution. Um, it's really not a place for the journal to adjudicate these things or determine who has contributed what, um, but you're absolutely right. There are lots of folks who are authors who have not met the particular criteria for authorship. I think that's the reality of it. You can always aspire to a higher standard, but. There's there's no there's no good way to make certain that that's actually what, what's transpired, and and of course the the dark side of that is the responsibility for the article. If it turns out that, um, you you know for for vanity reasons or you know political whatever, if somebody added your name said, hey, we're going to add your name to this paper. Do you mind? And you go, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, I love to have another thing on my CV, and then you find out, of course, that the primary author cooked the whole thing up um you know the, the sad fact is that uh and and jeff and i know exactly who this person is who's uh as a highly respected uh expert in in a, a what was at the time an up-and-coming field in in radiology and was the national leader in in many regards and was on the short list for department chairs until they got caught up in in a, a scandal and and uh, that was not not of their making at all but because they were a co-author of these papers it uh it kind of effectively terminated the advancement of their career it didn't tarnish their own reputation, well, indirectly tarnished the, their that person's reputation, but um, it it limited their ability to you know to move into other things. Yeah, so I think the the hope is that that accountability aspect might give someone pause to simply plug their name into an author right. list because <clears throat> they're going to be responsible whether they were or were not involved in the actual project. So, um, and I mean, I, I have seen times where uh, people have been listed as middle author and they've actually requested not to be an author just because they feel like they haven't contributed um even if you know the senior author, author kind of suggested it but it's it's kind of weird to say oh well i mean because again sometimes these middle authors may have important contributions but it's kind of weird to send them the, a draft of the paper and then they have no contributions and then you take them off the author list i mean you can't i don't know how you kind of get around that yeah these are these are difficult i don't have great answers to be honest um, Again, 
you, you hope that uh, the, the folks who are in charge would make certain that that is limited to whatever degree possible, but it clearly happens. And this is, again, kind of the dilemma for all of us on, on the receiving end of manuscripts that all we have is the list of names. You know, the good news is at least our journal and other RSNA journals, we send out now an email to everyone listed as an author, and they have to acknowledge that they, that they intend to be an author. So at least no one can go ahead and put your name on a paper, um, you know, and sort of use your good name, if you will, without your being aware of it. But as an editor of a paper, I have no real say. I can't look at a paper and say, well, you know, X, you know, this third author didn't really contribute. I have no information about that. That's entirely at the discretion of the authors. So it's it's really an important consideration for all of us in our 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 other lives as authors of of manuscripts. Unrelated question about co-first authors. So um, um, co-first authors typically still have an order. So um, I may be first and Chuck second. Uh, when Chuck puts it on his CV, do I still always go first, or is Chuck allowed to swap us and still keep the still keep the annotation saying, <laughs> "Hey, we're co-first authors, but I'm first for this," or at least maybe your opinion, because maybe this isn't about publishing, but I think it's somewhat related. <laughs> So uh, I'll just tell you what most people do on CVs, at least here, uh, that I've reviewed for promotion and tenure purposes that they will designate in their bibliography that they are dual first authors for a particular paper, but will list it in the order in which it appeared in the, in the journal as it was published. Cool. So they don't switch the names in other words. Thank you. Or put, or put an asterisk. Yeah, it's- it, Yeah, something. It, some it, an annotate it. For, yeah, annotate, annotate it, but leave the order. In some way. But you know, it's, it's so different because as as Jeff was saying about different fields in mathematics, of course, it's not uncommon. People will write one paper every three years, uh, more than single authorship in a lot of works in mathematics or theoretical physics is is kind of uncommon. Then you get to experimental physics, and they'll have two hundred fifty authors on on a paper, and they're you know put out several of those in a year with kind of a different combination of of people on them. Um, I, I think it, you know, to me, I find it hard to believe in some sense that more than true, literally a, a handful or two of people can really hold authorship of a work to, to have spent the effort to craft the words, to understand the purpose. Uh, and even if you have a hundred people and you want to recognize them, include them, I, I sort of think of it like the U.S. Constitution, where it had some 60 authors, but it had a writing committee of about three or four. And those were the people who really framed the, you know, did the wordsmithing um, and in a way were the authors of the document and then the others were signatories to it. Kareem, please. Yeah, uh, Dr. Klein, great presentation. Uh, this is a bit of a silly question, bear with me. I think everybody here knows about chat GPT and these AI tools that can essentially write for you. Um, you know, it's quite good at writing things, you know, at scientific writing, um, distilling concepts. Um, so I have to imagine like in the near future, we're going to get a non-negligible amount of papers or a large amount was probably written with assistance from an AI tool, or if not just outright written by an AI tool. Um, so I don't know, do you see a future where we're like writing acknowledgements to like these AI tools, maybe co-authorship? I don't know, that's silly because, you know, that requires accountability. But yeah, if you had any thoughts on the impact of AI writing tools on scientific writing and maybe how this impacts, you know, authorship or yeah, how we approach this, so. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I honestly don't really have any thoughts on it other than to say that obviously there's plenty of papers being published that are crafted with formulas developed by pharma and, and, and industry where you could argue it's sort of the same concept where they've got a formulaic method of reporting and then they have some ghostwriter plug in the information. Um, but not, no, I hadn't really given thought to the AI tools as regards authorship. I don't know if Chuck has anything to- Maybe talk. it's more of an ethics question, but, but yeah. And and the uh, more, and, and also how will we detect it for those people who choose not to indicate? I I, I was uh, actually going to do a, I was thinking of putting together and I haven't just, if I get to do an editorial, just sort of a, you know, here we are into the, you know, 
we're four, as Jeff said, we're four years into the journal and kind of, uh, you know, we're, uh, I think we're out of our infancy and kind of into our adolescence a bit. So I, I've gotten, I've gotten moody and I'm, and I'm experiencing a lot of existential angst. So, um, but, but I was going to include, you know, actually it was funny. I had some other folks who were, um, uh, asked me about writing editorial and I said sure and I said that would be great and I said by the way here's what chat GPT thinks about it and I actually put in uh, the topic and it spat out a nice you know high school level five paragraph essay about their their topic and actually then also picked up the uh, I gave, you know I said and and what are the arguments against and it, it went through and um, it's for what it does it's remarkably it's really and you know admittedly it is impressive i you know the other question is unlike um unlike uh, hugging face and some of the image generators uh i'm not sure what the copyright situation is on text that's generated by chat gpt because the images that are generated are actually technically owned by uh the company that that runs the, the but uh, chat gpt i don't know if i suspect you could do a fair use you know you could take a paragraph that it generates because there was certainly an article in new york times that actually uh i think cited a whole essay uh in fact from it but you know new york times tends to get a little kind of a special uh you know i'm sure they worked something out but you know i don't know what the i don't know if they have a licensing requirement or anything else that goes along with it they very well might i haven't looked at it i was hey. going to say that yeah. seems like a perfect use uh or copyright is something i hadn't thought about until we talked about today but copyright i think is the biggest problem there because i thought about a different use which is if i just give the bullet points so i've written my outline and say here's my outline for paragraph one give me the paragraph that here's reference one two three four just format this so i've still given the content and so I feel like this is maybe ethically a bit better in some way, but then, the, as you said, the, who, does does Microsoft own that copyright then, or open AI? Not clear. Yeah, I, I, and you, need, and you need to give them authorship credit. <laughs> <laughs> and and who's gonna and and is Chat GPT going to? Well, I, I, it would probably write a very eloquent. Uh, it, it would probably write the legal document. In fact, granting you intellectual property rights. Uh, John, you had a comment? Yeah, you can actually detect OpenAI uh, chat GPT now. Uh, so there's something that Hugging Face actually developed with OpenAI called Roberta Base, R-O-B-E-R-T-A, based off of the bird, the National Language Transporting. And it will give you a confidence interval, uh, just like when you're looking at uh, plagiarism. Uh, and it'll give you a, a percentage chance of something. Yeah. So give that a try, the Roberta Base. It's open. I think it's huggingface.co backslash Roberta dash base something um and that you can you can run in whatever the, the thing is and it'll give you like 99.6 percent chance uh gpt so there those are in place uh and there's a couple other tools that are coming about that'll give a watermark uh to some of these um these natural mm -hmm. language processing things well because you can only imagine for for us it's one thing but for a lot of high school science teachers you know right if you get it to write an essay about the solar system it's really pretty pretty darn good at it um yeah yeah that's so nice to know that there's some detection mechanisms i guess we're going to have to build that in now pretty soon as well yeah i'm just uh, um adding to that i'm kind of preparing a talk for next next week at SIO where i'm like talking a little bit about publishing ai so i i use the chat GPT, just ask some silly questions. So like, please write my research paper. Then it asks, what are you writing about? And then I said, yeah, artificial intelligence in radiology. And then you get like, I mean, it doesn't really tell you what to write, but the funny thing is it gives you quite some hints, you know, where to focus, for example, uh, you know, things ethics or diagnosing something. So it kind of gives you some clues, you know, in which direction to go. It's, um, and then when you ask, um, how do I get an AI paper accepted in radiology, artificial intelligence? It gives you a, re a list <laughs> what you check and what you should look for. It's just kind of interesting the uh, the answers you get there. <laughs> awesome! This claim checklist come up? <laughs> um, not the claim checklist, but it's um, I mean it's kind of close. I mean there's like follow the journal submission guidelines. Um, yeah, and then some other things. So you're getting close to just 
I think the claim checklist uh, and the link for it. Well, thank you everybody for a really robust discussion. Jeff, thank you for uh, for a great presentation today. Really, really informative and and uh, and enjoyable. And I think uh, for the, for our editors who are also authors, really uh, a lot a lot to think about here. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Folks, thank, thank you, Dr. You thank you, Chuck. We'll see. We'll see you all next month. Bye now. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye -bye. Thanks.